שיר למעלות. אשא עיניי אל ההרים, מאין יבוא עזרי. עזרי מעם השם, עושה שמיים וארץ, אל יתן למות רגליך, אל ינום שומריך. Dear viewers, this video was put together with pictures on the web that closely describe as best as possible the visions given me by God in an attempt to pull me out of a world in bondage to sin into God's marvelous truth in everlasting life. To understand God's purpose for our lives, one must ponder on His word, also taking all visions, dreams, and lessons learned in life into consideration. This was one of many visions, but this one I knew was God's final call for me to come home. It became very clear to me that there are huge differences between visions and dreams. The difference to me is, in a dream, you can wake yourself up. In 2008, I was around 30 years old, and upon going to sleep one night, I fell asleep, and I woke up, and I was driving. The sun was shining, the birds were chirping, and I was talking on the phone with my uncle, and we were laughing, and it was just like every other normal day. I was cussing listening to the radio, driving through Las Vegas. A lukewarm Christian. At one point of the conversation, I remember looking around and seeing flashing lights or something was going on around me. And I started to tell my uncle, you know, something strange is going on over here. And uh, my uncle got quiet. And then he started to tell me that he was sensing something wrong was going on too. And just as uh, we were talking about it, my uncle says to me, you know what? I think it's the end of the world. And I said, you know what, Unc? I think it is too. I slammed on my brakes and looked up. And oh my God, my heart dropped. I was looking ahead of me. And what was before my eyes? Four giant knights on four giant horses with armor on, smoking, on fire looking. And I couldn't believe what was before my eyes. Are these the four horsemen of the apocalypse? The four horsemen who I've heard of when I was a kid. I remember I asked myself, was I dreaming? And closed my eyes and opened them, but they were still there. I remember one of them looked over to the other ones and said something in a real barbaric voice and they all started laughing at me hysterically like I was the tail end of an old joke.
I didn't know what to think, but I knew that I wasn't dreaming. I knew the four horsemen were in front of me, laughing at me. I knew I was about to die. They took one last glance at me and took off on their horses up the city streets. I sat there paralyzed and watched them run off into the distance. Just as they left my sight, I thought they were gone for good. And I felt a sense of peace for a second. And then I looked. I was back on the city streets. Everything had went back to normal. And I was looking, and I thought I started to see them coming back. So I stared, and I did see something coming back. All of a sudden, military soldiers and tanks flooded the streets, pushing people into the streets into a line. As they got closer, I noticed they were like half demon, half human soldiers in uniforms. The four horsemen never left my mind. The soldiers were coming out of everywhere. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Everybody there saw that these soldiers were evil. Get in the lines, they screamed. And as much as they were shoving people, I saw nobody resist. So they forced us to walk. And we walked. And we walked. I could hear the sound of the gravel underneath my feet. We walked for hours, it seemed. Yet the Lord still did not wake me up. I knew this wasn't a dream. I knew that I was forced into a line and that the country was at war or something. And all I could think was, it was such a beautiful day. How could it come to this? But I wasn't dreaming. This was for real. People everywhere were crying and screaming. But the weird thing was, I didn't see any kids. People from all walks of life forced into a line, forced to march to who knows where. Then the unimaginable happened. 
As I looked around at everyone's faces, everyone looked with such disappointment in their eyes. The disappointment and the sorrow that I felt at that moment was like no other sorrow. It was almost dark at that time. Nobody said a word. Everybody sat there with their mouths wide open. The whirlwind of God came down from the sky and started sucking up lights, souls and souls of lights. The rapture was taking place. It was quite a sight to see the Lord coming for his children. I didn't know what to think because I did not get sucked up yet. And as the whirlwind went on, the whirlwind also started to fade away. And I was realizing, what about me? What about me? I was thinking to myself, was I condemned for eternity? Keep it moving. Stay in the line. So we walked. And we walked. And the Lord still did not wake me up. I knew this was real. So we finally came to a checkpoint. I was so lost, so confused. I think we got left. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew the further I got to the checkpoint, the deeper and darker the faces of the soldiers got, the more evil they looked. Then I remember the razor wire fences. As we got closer and closer to the checkpoint, I remember thinking to myself, this is not where I am supposed to be. I was supposed to go in the whirlwind with God. There were thousands of people in front of me. And as we got closer and closer to the checkpoint, I started noticing I was hearing people screaming at the top of their lungs. Thousands of people rounded up like cattle to the slaughter. There were so many people in front of me, I couldn't see what was going on ahead of me. But I heard the screams of men and women. They were watching us all close with their machine guns. Their sights were on us. Then I saw them pushing people over a line. So I scooted around the people in front of me to try to see what was ahead. And I saw them pushing people over a line. And as soon as they crossed the line, they were marked. Get in the line, they screamed as they pushed people over the lines. And as I got closer, 
I saw them push a guy over the line and a giant knot popped out of his forehead with a giant scar looking thing over it. One person at a time, one person after another, they pushed over this checkpoint and knots would come out of their heads and then some people I noticed a knot would come out of their arm. So it was either the arm or the forehead. Thousands of people ahead of me. Now it came down to five people ahead of me. And I watched as they pushed people over these lines and as they marked people. And then came I. Get in the line! And they grabbed me and they pushed me over the lines. And I remember looking at the demon that did it as he pushed me over the line. A giant knot would pop out of my forearm. An ugly, hideous knot with a scar looking thing over it. Right then I knew I had been marked. The knot on my arm was so ugly that as I was walking with everybody, I covered it up with my shirt because I did not want to look at it anymore. And I started walking and I was thinking, Lord, I have the mark of the beast on me. What do I do? And just then I heard a bunch of people crying around the corner, crying coming out of a building. So I decided to check it out. As I looked around the corner, I saw a huge concrete building with one entrance with no door. So I started heading toward the building. I could hear crying coming from out of the building. And as I walked toward it, I walked in the door and saw several rooms inside. And as I started walking toward the rooms, the cries got louder and louder. Never have I imagined to ever be in a, this position. I walked into a room full of people weeping and wailing. And it was so sad that I walked out and went to another room. I looked in and I saw a man sitting there crying. Everyone knew we had been marked. Everyone knew we were going to die or be executed or we were going to hell. And there was no turning around. There was no God to bail us out this time. We were left behind. A moment later, I backed against the wall and a girl I knew from before ran up to me and I told her I've sinned too much. I pushed her away. And she walked away sobbing. I remember sliding my back down the wall and crouching down and putting my head between my knees and crying. Lord, please get me out of here. Lord, please help me. Come.
come And the land is dark And the moon is the only light we'll see No, I won't be afraid Oh, I won't be afraid Just as long as you stand Stand by me So darling, darling, stand by me Oh, stand by me Oh, stand Stand by me Stand by me If the sky that we look upon Should tumble and fall Or the mountain should crumble Just as long as you stand, stand by me. And darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. Oh, stand now. Stand by me. Stand by me. Hi, I'm Paul Begley. Are we on the brink of the beast? Are we living in the days of the apocalypse? You've had the dead cows that died in Wisconsin. You know that on New Year's Eve at 12 minutes to midnight, 5,000 blackbirds fell out of the sky in BB, Arkansas dead. We know the next morning 100,000 fish washed ashore on the river of Arkansas. And on the 14th of January, we know that over 200 cows fell dead in Wisconsin. We've had the 40,000 dead devil crabs in Kenya, the 7,000 cattle and buffalo that fell dead in Vietnam, the blackbirds that fell out of the sky in Texas and Louisiana, Ireland and Sweden, Brazil and Venezuela, Kentucky, California. We know that God is doing a sign, and we can read that in Hosea chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, the riots within the Muslim nations, what I call the Muslim monarchies, and Tunisia has fallen, Egypt is falling, Yemen is protesting, Jordan has fired their government trying to prevent it, Syria had a day of wrath of which they protested, Saudi Arabia is concerned, there is something going on, there's a rise, a revolution within the Muslim hierarchy. But now, on MSNBC, there was, while they were showing the riots in Egypt, and you can find it right here on YouTube, there was a pale horse, a pale horse with a rider on it. It looked almost like a ghost, and be, it began to gallop through the, the rioting in Egypt. There was an explosion behind it. Some have said they even seen for a second, potentially, a red horse. I have watched the video, though, of the pale horse and its rider. Whether that video is doctored or not, I don't know. I don't know. Technology can do a lot. But I do know what the Bible says, that the spirit of the apocalypse is near. Matter of fact, let's go there and read it. From the book of Revelation, we're going to go to the sixth chapter. And then you can go see for yourself on the other videos. But here we go. The Bible says... Revelation chapter 6 And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals and I heard 
as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. There was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the fourth beast say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. His name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. I'm Paul Begley. I'm trying to reach you. I'm trying to get a grasp, an understanding. Can we really be living in the days of the apocalypse? Are we on the brink of the beast? I have no doubt in my mind that Hosea chapter 4 verses 1, 2, and 3 are the ancient prophetic words of a prophet from years gone by who was forced to marry a prostitute to understand the spiritual adultery of the children of Israel of his day. But in the midst of his preaching and prophesying, God showed him of a day when, because there is no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land, and because of swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, God said the land would mourn, it would languish, he said that the, that the beast of the field, the fowls of heaven, the fish of the sea would be taken away and the people would mourn. Hosea chapter 4, the Hosea prophecy. Now we're looking at Egypt, the uprising of a Muslim nation, a Muslim monarchy falling to its knees as Mubarak, the modern day Pharaoh, refuses to surrender his power, just like in the days of Moses. But the people, the Egyptians, have taken to the streets. And you can read it in Isaiah chapter 19, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. It tells you that the Egyptians will fight against the Egyptians, and brother against brother, kingdom against kingdom, city against city. It tells you we're living in this day, that there will be a new king. He'll be, he'll be fierce. A Lord, he'll be cruel. It's called the burden of Egypt. That prophecy is upon us now. And now, this pale horseman riding across the television screens of MSNBC and around the world, I don't know. I'm not sure about that, but I know what the Bible says. That we are nearing the end. Are you saved? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you ever been born again? I want to encourage you. Would you send me a, a, an email right now, right here on YouTube? Send it to me, a private message saying, I want to be saved. I want to pray with you. I want you to find Christ as your Savior. I believe it will change your life as we prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm Paul Begley. God be with us all. God be with us all.
At least four people were shot dead and 13 were wounded as overnight the battle for Tahrir Square in central Cairo took on an increasingly violent turn. Pro-Hosni Mubarak supporters are said to have opened fire on anti-government protesters. Egypt's army has now begun deploying tanks in among the protesters. The nighttime deaths add to those killed yesterday, underlying just how dangerous the demand for democracy has become. Many see the increase in violence as an attempted government-backed crackdown on the pro-democracy demonstrations. Mubarak promised on Tuesday to surrender power in September to try to defuse the unprecedented challenge to his 30-year rule, but his refusal to go immediately angered protesters. Hours later, the army told the reformers to go back home as Mubarak backers throwing petrol bombs and wielding sticks gathered on the outskirts of the central square and tried to gain entry. Now the government is calling for an end to the protest before talks over constitutional change can begin. But the activists are refusing, building up to Friday's planned march on the presidential palace.